Well, you may wonder why someone who spent uh, uh, the life analyzing telecoms would talk to you and what, what do we have to share and say and why did we change the title of the presentation a little bit and, and, and et cetera. I think it was good that we talked about culture. It was good we talked about automation. But the next thing that we think is really important is what we call digital connectivity because the uh, digital connectivity technologies, the wireless technologies will really enable lots of this transformation. And I was just attending the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona uh, earlier this month and it's very clear that 5G is coming, the IoT is coming, the vendors are far more confident than they were before. And uh, that makes us to think about things strategically. My customers are mostly investors. Uh, but we also speak to industrial companies or, or, or communications companies. Uh, and we want to share, I want to share today how we see some of the very big picture trends. There's a lot of content. I may not be able to go through all the details. That's why, um, luckily, I didn't forget the, <laughs> to, 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 to bring this presentation here. But uh, if uh, we run out of copies, so if you need to contact me, please feel free uh, through, ideally through email, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you. Uh, now, why is this important? Um, you may, some of you may have seen that uh, the um, wholesale op open access networks may actually become an uh, election topic of Donald Trump in the US, uh, whereas his rival is, has, has come out with some, a potential rival on, on the Democratic side has come out with some ideas about uh, uh, regulating the big tech industry. So these things will be more important in the future, I think, than we think now. And lots of people who look at these things and, uh, and, and discuss these things talk about sharing, shared economy, shared infrastructure, etc. So let's look into that because sharing means less competition. Do we want less competition? These are very fundamental questions. So uh, I just wanted to start with two slides saying that the open PC standard essentially led to everyone having a PC, with you, basically the third industrial revolution. Uh, open internet, the net neutrality, uh, we know what happened. We know the, the, the social networks and, and all this uh, OTT, the, the, uh, the, the, the big tech industry that, that, uh, that uh, uh, is partially a result of that opening. So the question is now, we open uh, some of the underlying network infrastructure and perhaps some of the tech platforms, uh, are we going to uh, help what we may call Industry 4.0 or, or the fourth industrial revolution? What is interesting is it's actually the companies themselves who made this move. Is moved. It's not the regulators necessarily, but regulation played a role in this. Um, about year and a half ago, we came with this concept we call Digitex, techno Digital Technology Connectivity and Service, where we basically argue that if we make a little bit more open uh, infrastructure on the telecom side and a little bit more uh, opening on the, on the platform side, so in other words, if I can use the words oligopoly that, that these, these things tackle, we can create a nice little industry in the middle and what is important that companies from different uh, industries will be able to take part in this. Um, what I want to go through very quickly is, uh, is, is, is uh, first giving some background very quickly and then go through some economic, political and technology aspects and, and, and showing you why this is relevant for you. In terms of the history, uh, what I would say is that the wired radio te uh, technologies were uh, developed or established very long time ago. Then it took about 100 years before it started commercially applying and booming and, 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 and making big things, but the speed of the change is, is, is accelerating. The two key founding principles of the digital connectivity ecosystems are net infrastructure competitions. We've got multiple networks, nationwide networks, and net neutrality, which essentially means opening at the IP layer. It worked very well in terms of initial stimulating the investments. It worked very well in terms of the global scale economies in the apps. But these two principles have also uh, created some challenges that we uh, would, uh, that, that, that are showing now. But before 
uh, talking about the challenges, let's see what has been achieved. There are five billion, over five billion mobile users in the world. The usage data is, 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 is quite amazing. On average, a US consumer spends four hours each day uh, with their phone. And uh, it created lots of value, uh, uh, although it's, it's, it's quite concentrated at the uh, big tech companies. In terms of the challenges, I think uh, to, to quickly summarize it, I think we're starting, to, we're seeing a little lack of competition, lack of diversity, both at the top and the bottom of the, of the chain, which means the networks as well as the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the big tech companies. Uh, there's issues around cybersecurity, privacy, health. I'm sure none of this is new. Uh, one thing I would point out is that the innovation, the focus has largely been direct on the consumer and the, the, the value chain has not always taken the part that, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, some, of my, uh, some of people might have expected. I still remember when I opened my um, uh, desk computer, I got this Office 2010, but most people got the latest phone. So the technology that they use as consumer, which is maybe not necessarily that productive, is far more advanced that, we, that, that, that many people use in, in, in their offices. We also know roughly what comes next. The connectivity becomes universal, uh, uh, largely unlimited. We can, we can talk about this more, but, uh, and, and a mo much higher number of things will be connected than has been so far. That will clearly require new regulation. There will be uh, all this robotics automation will lead to major shifts in, 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 in power and economic value. And some of these things will have to be tackled. Uh, there's also global phenomena in terms of globalization, the competition between countries and, and, and cetera. And finally, in terms of these predictions, let me say that uh, the wireless connectivity is going to go beyond smartphones. This is a big topic for us. I think there are three areas, the variables, anything that you can put on a human or an animal, uh, smart property management, uh, going from managing cities, offices, homes, agriculture, to uh, the robots. Now, uh, this is maybe going to be a little bit heavier. I, I, I try to be, um, to be brief and, again, open to further discussions. From an economic point of view, I think we need to identify which assets we are talking about, which uh, business, which markets we are talking about, and which models, economic models, uh, have been applied, and whether the ones that, that are being applied, and whether the viewpoints of the companies and the policymakers are the right ones. So the, uh, the, the assets are essentially the network infrastructure, spectrum, equipment, and big data. The markets that we can identify is the, basically the consumer markets, the wholesale markets, the m and markets for investing and, and, and getting into the industry and, and, uh, and, and getting out of the industry. And then also quite importantly, and this importance of this is rising today, is competition between countries. So there'll be competition, some sorts of competition in all these markets. Interestingly, the regulators have usually focused on the first ones more than the, uh, than, than the other one. Uh, and uh, this one I borrowed from uh, Professor Dieter Helm from the University of Oxford, uh, who's the, a, a leading expert on this, and, and he knows far more than I do about the, uh, the regulations. The three models, economic models you can look at, essentially, to put it very simply, the neoclassical assumes that competition solves everything. When there is market failure, that somehow needs to be addressed. But uh, making extra return is a bad thing. The Austrian assumes that uh, the businesses are there to make money, so the extra returns is okay, but the uh, competition, this, this M&A market getting in and getting out uh, assures the uh, efficient outcome. The RAP model, which is something that I'd like to discuss a little bit more, is basically saying, you know, there's some markets where you have national scale uh, or, or national monopoly economies, and it is worthwhile building some infrastructure with some targets, call it national industrial policy, and then build the whole ecosystem around that. Um, just quickly touching on those uh, four asset classes. So the issue with telecom, the infrastructure is 
first, there's subscriber scale economies. If I, if I got 10 million and my competitor has 2 million, unless regulation helps the 2 million one, they, they cannot make money with the same network and they, cannot, they, can, they can never make it. Uh, unless they subsidize and, 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 and lose a lot of money, which basically destroys the market for, for, for everyone. The uh, telecom companies can never get a long-term contract that matches the duration of their investment. No telecom regulation in the world provides that. Uh, the network innovation is limited in, in a way, in certain ways. I, would, I wouldn't say in, in every respect, but in certain ways. Uh, the new technologies, on the contrary, like fiber, give practically unlimited capacity, which reduces the need to duplicate. And there may be some external uh, negative externalities as well uh, linked to this duplication. <coughs> Spectrum is a little bit different. Spectrum is not unlimited. It's a finite resource. Uh, but the way that Spectrum is being awarded today is quite some people would say archaic. It's, it's, it's certainly not a free market in Spectrum when you can buy and sell and, and, and essentially put the Spectrum to the most efficient use. Uh, there's a lot of constraints uh, that basically create this industry that owns the private Spectrum, but then often the utilization of that private Spectrum is low because there is economic incentive to so-called hoard it, which means uh, buy it uh, to prevent others from, from, from using it. Um, I will talk a little bit later about what we expect in terms of the dynamic spectrum and, 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 and other, uh, other, other developments. Um, equipment, I'll be simple, there are big scale economies in equipment and we have seen uh, recently uh, with the uh, uh, US-China uh, tensions and situation that there is a lot of politics in the equipment market as well, which means that uh, the equipment market doesn't seem to be a perfect competition uh, either. And the big data market currently dominated by a small number of large global players. There's some attempts like GDPR to, to, to address the consumer side of it. Uh, we can debate whether this is going to lead to more efficient market in big data. But uh, many people, including The Economist magazine, predict that uh, uh, creating an efficient market or more efficient market in data is one of the most important challenges if we want to move this, uh, uh, this uh, fourth industrial revolution forward. Uh, so now let me give you a, a quick vision for the wireline and the wireless industry. So the only thing I would say about the wireline that I, I think is, is sort of worth thinking about is whether or not we just add it to the utilities and we basically see the fiber is the same as a water pipe because it has unlimited capacity, easy to share. And uh, uh, in some way, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we treat it in a similar way. There is still a big debate in the industry. There's a fixed wireless alternative to this, which the US is currently going for. But there may be reasons which I'm happy to discuss in, in the Q&A why the US may be a little bit different and have a little bit different incentives than, than, than Europe. But, the, but turning the, the, the fiber to a utility and, and essentially pushing the, this investment as infrastructure investment that may potentially offer better returns for the country than, I don't know, high-speed rail or something on the dollar invested is, 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 is quite relevant. Two points about the wireless industry. First, and I think this is very important for you as well, the automation will start with the companies, with the industrial companies. I don't see robots walking on the streets and, and, and doing something economically useful. I can very well see warehouses, production plants with these technologies being implemented. For that, you will need these small cell networks that provide seamless co coverage but also low latency and, 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 and other things that the 5G can provide. But the question is, if I own this factory or this uh, the service area, would I want, um, uh, would I want a, 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 a nationwide telecom company to provide this? Do I want to build the network myself? Do I want to uh, have more options for that? So the private networks, the, uh, the, the nationwide wireless, uh, is, is, is then, uh, the, then questions become, is it going to be like a public service? Do we want this differentiation? I think in the UK there is now this debate about uh, essentially equalization of the coverage in the countryside, which kind of disrupts the telecom industry. Uh, 
And uh, since I'm also a telecoms analyst, I, I just wanted to show you some charts. This is the, the right hand side is the European telecoms index in the past five years. And I've been telling everyone that it's going down and uh, each, each point uh, people say, ah, oh, this is now going to reverse. And it hasn't because there is a fundamental problem with the business model that these companies are running. We have some answers to this. This is this Digitex transformation, but essentially we think that the telecom industry is going to face unprecedented uh, disruptive threats, also from the tech industry. Bear in mind that you can run a network without owning the parts. There are pre there's precedent, there's Airbnb, there is Uber. Uh, technology industry may be in a very good position to actually move into that. Spectrum is a barrier, but the question is, do we want Spectrum, as if for the sake of the whole economy, do we want Spectrum to be, uh, to be a barrier uh, in this? Um, there's also some good reasons why the telecom industry is a little bit like this cultural change that we discussed uh, earlier. Uh, there are obviously threats for these companies and, and, and there's some pushback, but the key pushback is politics and regulation. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes to look, uh, looking at some of the key issues around politics and regulations here. So first, the neoclassical model is actually failing. And it's, it's failing even more now when we get this, uh, this uh, uh, unlimited capacity in some of the, uh, some of the infrastructures. The uh, legacy investment and the inflexible spectrum market are obviously making it very hard to, to implement or to get the kind of outcome that we wanted to get. So in telecoms, in Europe at least, we've had this oscillation between excessive competition when at some direct regulatory interference boosts the, uh, the, the, the competition, but it's artificial. In 2017, it created the best telecom performing company, which is Drillish in Germany. But this was a purely a result of, 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 of regulation. Um, uh, and, and, and then when the regulation eases, you basically go back to the, to the, to the oligopolies. Uh, there's also political debates now, as when you can read in, in, in the headlines about OTTs and uh, telecoms, the use of personal data, the credibility of the information on the platform, the benefit of having this concentrated platform on the OTT side, the consumer pricing, uh, the way how infrastructure is uh, in, in investments work, and etc. On the, on, the, on the telecom side. But this is important. The current telecom industry may have incentive to protect legacy rather than build the new uh, infrastructure. Um, in, in, in a way, I think what is driving this investment, I mean, when you pay your phone bill, big chunk of it, potentially majority goes for these future investments. But if there is not a perfect competition between the network, what is actually driving these investments? This is a, 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 a valid question. I think increasingly, and I've had uh, been um, at some discussions also in the UK context, uh, uh, there is likely to be some digital national policies and, and there will be some targets that they're already there in Europe, but I think I think we're increasingly, as we see the competition between countries, moving in that, uh, in, in, in that direction. Also, national security is playing uh, more, more role in this. Um, in terms of consumer versus network competition, uh, the point I wanted to make is that the, uh, the politicians, when I spoke to them, uh, some of them even in, in the UK, I think that they are worried about the rise of this populism. And one of the way to respond to this is to do something that is very visible for the consumer. The EU did the roaming, for example. Um, uh, the question is whether it's saying that you will have four operators instead of three operators is something that will win you votes. Probably not as much. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's a, again, a new phenomenon in terms of regulation. And finally, in terms of competition between countries, clearly the infrastructure is becoming more important than it was before in that uh, competition. But different regions, different countries come from different, uh, they have different global competitive advantages and hence the policies may differ more. And we have been involved in a number of countries ranging from Europe, the UK, up to a number of emerging markets. So I've got lots of examples to, to share. Obviously last, not the least, the US. Uh, these 5G slides, uh, uh, they come from our tech team. Uh, the 
only message here is that 5G will basically bring better broadband, the ultra low latency and ultra reliable communications and a lot of uh, connected devices. And the main difference is actually not that it is more efficient, more spectral efficient, but it uses massively more spectrum in the higher band. So the networks will need to be uh, denser, which is huge investment, which makes the current model hard to implement. There have been some launches. Uh, uh, I, I, what I would say is uh, just the feedback from Barcelona uh, from some of the vendors presentation that uh, this can potentially take off faster than 4G did. Uh, um, and and uh, unfortunately, the telecoms don't have really strong business models under their current uh, uh, you know, environment, but, 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 but the, the, the pressure is there to invest in these technologies. And it's not going to be about smartphones. Despite the nice foldable smartphones that have been launched and that they cost you know, thousands of two and two, three thousands of, of euro, uh, it's, it, the, the smartphone will do exactly the same thing as it does now. So it's going to be about IoT, it's going to be about other things. Even in 4G, smartphones didn't move the global uh, handset market at all. So my last slide um, is on the trends that I think they are relevant for CIOs and, and, and the industry to watch. Uh, uh, the first, and again, it's just a summary of what I said. The IoT is here. We have heard some use cases, and there will be more use cases. But importantly, with the 5G technologies, they will just allow it to happen in far bigger scale than uh, we had before. There's also battery technology advancements and other things that will be necessary. That will lead to AI cloud compute cloud driven solutions. So you're moving the capacity to the to the cloud. There were lots of fancy applications on the show in Barcelona that run already on on on, on 5G and, and and show this. There's still a couple of years R&D to uh, to to go into this, but uh, some of these things can be already applied now, which makes me say that the enterprise should be should get alerted about this, should get actively involved in this, and uh, find a way how they work with telecoms, with tech, with other partners, what sort of long-term partnership may be good, which assets, which data you want to own, which stuff you're willing to outsource. And I think these questions should be discussed already because, because uh, competition is already doing it. In, in, in Barcelona, we've seen a number of uh, industrial companies in the, at the very high level keynote discussions on these topics uh, uh, already. Um, and last, not the least, uh, policies matter. I mean, I spent quite, a, uh, quite some time in Brussels uh, talking to the uh, commission and the, 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 the parliament about the, when the new telecoms law was being drafted. Uh, we're, we, we've, we have discussions in a couple of other countries on this, but uh, I'm an independent analyst, so I'm, I'm just sharing thoughts. I'm, I'm like an economist. I'm saying this is, this is what's going to work. Uh, but uh, obviously, industrial companies have their interests, and they should uh, see, they should understand these topics. They should look at digital connectivity, understand these topics, and see what is actually uh, in their interest and what, 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 what is doable and what's not, so that you can... Uh, ultimately use this uh, digital connectivity to improve your efficiency and uh, launch your new products. Uh, so we do uh, equity research. We also have this city global perspective and solutions. If you type in city GPS, this is actually free content on, on, in, in various areas. Uh, under my name, you can see the digital connectivity uh, reports. Here are the presentations, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Talibor. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Um, I have one to start with, if I may. Um, you talked uh, a little bit about what we should be doing in terms of discussions as CIOs, but is there anything tangible that we should be doing as CIOs to prepare for this? Or are there things we should not be doing? Is there, are there any blind alleys that we shouldn't be going down because we know 5G is coming? <laughs> well, I try side. to address this in the previous slide, right? So, so, so um, I think what is important is to look into the future. I think most companies 
look short term, what's the next quarter's numbers? What is, and, and this, is, this is also what's kind of decimated the communication industry uh, among, among others. Uh, you should really look how these things can play out in the next five years. And uh, just take some realistic views in terms of what role you can play in this game, which, uh, which are your core competencies, and perhaps, and I'm giving this advice to the telecoms or communications companies as well, think about option value for your expansion in digital connectivity. So, for example, what we are saying to the telecoms companies, look, you've got the networks, it's a, it may be a nice oligopoly now, it won't last forever, but you have this fantastic opportunity to create a digital company and use the network advantage while you have it to, uh, to, to bring these digital products to their customers. We have worked with some companies in Turkey, there is one in Kenya, uh, which uh, it's actually easier to do some of these things in emerging markets because of regulations. The regulations, unfortunately, in Europe are quite complex and, and, and often used as an excuse for not doing things or for, for you know, justification of a failure. But in my experience, the, uh, the, the, there's got to be some consensus in the UK, in Europe, about how to, do, how to, how to uh, develop these things. Just try to see what's realistic and get ready for it. I think that's... Do you see wired networking inside organizations going away completely from, you know, within the companies? With, with all the stuff that's coming with wireless, do you, do you see wired connectivity going away completely? No, I mean, it depends on what you mean by wire. I mean, we don't look at connectivity as wired and wireless, right? I think it's, it's, it's one network that there's some parts are efficient to be connected with wire and some of them are not. In, in terms of the end user equipment, like customer, people, humans, probably wireless is the end game, right? It's already getting there. Uh, in terms of uh, the IoT, I'm actually not sure. And I'll give you this example. I recently uh, visited this shopping mall where I noticed that there is this board and you can type in your car number and it will tell you exactly where it is and show you the picture of you <laughs> leaving the car. So I'm not sure it's compatible with the data regulations, but anyway. Uh, and so I looked up and I saw, you know, there are cameras everywhere basically uh, at every, every space. Now, guess what? This is absolutely not a 5G opportunity in any foreseeable future. There is nothing to do with wireless because you've got to power the camera so you connect them through a wire, right? Uh, whereas uh, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do wirelessly, but one of the uh, two, two topics that we are looking at, the wireless one, is batteries. This is very important, and it will restrict the bandwidth, it will restrict the performance of, of, of these things, and health implications as well. I think, I think they, this is... Uh, uh, there's a completely different thing if you want to put the, the antenna absolutely everywhere, uh, and, and, and these things need to be researched. So I, I think it is, it, is, it is going to be a combination. Thank you. Interesting. Right. Would anyone else like to? Oh, we've got lots of questions on the floor. Um, gentleman at the front here. I would like to know. Um, I think the answer is that there will be debates in America. It may be part of the election campaign. It may be happening, you know. Uh, th my best guess, my guess prediction, if I look at this globally, is that look at what happened with Microsoft in the software market uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, I uh, watched the CEO of Microsoft uh, today in, in Barcelona talking about the, how they reformed uh, uh, Microsoft, the, the, the company. This was amazing. Now, uh, it was triggered by initially by some regulatory moves, but uh, usually you don't see the, uh, the regulators in places like the US destroying these companies. And these companies are vital for the economy. Uh, but I think when you push things a little bit, open up a little bit here and there, uh, you can create huge opportunities for something new to arise. It did happen uh, with Microsoft and we had all these big companies, internet companies uh, now. I think something like that will probably happen. But 
I'm, 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 I'm afraid to say that uh, it's up to a longer discussion first and, 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 and second, uh, my personal feeling speaking to some telecoms and tech companies in the US earlier this year is that everyone is in this kind of wait and see mode right now because there's a lot of politics in the US itself around this. But at the same time, which is important, the US is now facing a lot of pressure from China where the, 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 the China is moving more decisively. So I think that will trigger some uh, some rethink in the big data as well. Uh, and obviously the third element is the stuff like GDPR, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the regulations. Okay, we had uh, a couple at the back, so one, there, one down there. Um, so something like, um, like um, well, I think uh, it, the, 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 the problem with the networks, because of the scale economies and the externalities, et cetera, is that, that you don't really have competing networks. I mean, there, there's some parts of the networks that compete, some parts that, that, that are being shared. But this idea that you build five different networks and they will differentiate in service, et cetera, is just impossible also because of net neutrality. What I think will happen, and I, I kind of touched on this in the uh, wireless and wireline's vision, is that in wireless, the tech industry will actually move into this space. Uh, we've already seen some signs of this. Um, uh, uh, when I say, for example, companies like Amazon, we, we wrote a report about this where, where, where they, they, the initiative around the private networks in, in the US. These are very early stages, so I wouldn't necessarily um, give you a great amount of detail. But I think in general, uh, when there is going to be demand for these private networks by industrial companies. Obviously, not every industrial company has the skill set to build, maintain these things, bringing the robots. This is a tech industry's uh, uh, area of expertise. And some of the big tech companies are likely to have competitive advantages that industrial companies around the world will need. So, but, but these companies need to reconnect with the businesses. They have focused on consumers so far, largely, right? They are already refocusing the cloud services, et cetera. I think that's going to continue. And uh, um, if you know the dynamic spectrum access or the CBDR, uh, there's, a, there's a, basically a project in the, uh, in the US uh, which uh, where the government allocates some spectrum to the tech companies as opposed to the telecom industry, and then they can directly, in certain locations, manage it and allocate it to, to, to private companies. So for example, I have a network just in this building or in, in an industrial park. The tech industry can uh, make sure that I have spectrum here and someone in the next town or the next building has the spectrum and they manage the, the interference. And uh, essentially, who runs the network? Is it a tech company? Is it, is it the company that owns the premises? I don't know. It's, it's, it's a shared economy. It's, it's a new concept. And I think that is the disruptive challenge. It's not a competitor that does the same thing. Europe tried that, but it doesn't, it's not really working. It's a, it's a disruptive challenge from the tech industry, from outside the communication industry. Okay, um, we'll, we'll take one more at the back and then we'll, we'll have to do that one quickly as well because we really will have to close and get to the next one. Well, I, I, again, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, question, right? I, th I think there will be some collaboration and there will be some competition, but this whole landscape would need to be redrawn. Uh, um, I think, uh, again, maybe we can just take this question after this because it, <laughs> it's a... I'd like to join me in thanking Dalibor for a fascinating talk. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs>